Well, where we are at the moment is in the Blue Lagoon, which is the product of a power station, uh, the water that we use to heat up our houses and such. Now, after uh, they've used the water in the power stations, it flows onto the lava field to create this absolutely gorgeous uh, lagoon where people now can come visit and bathe in the run of water. This water is good not only for the body but as well for the soul because it makes you feel absolutely wonderful. Isolated at the juncture of the North Atlantic and the Arctic Oceans is the Nordic country of Iceland. Due to its location above a hot spot called the Iceland Plume, this country is rife with volcanic activity, hot springs, and geysers. Geothermal power is captured and distributed to houses across Iceland, covering 85% of the country's heat and electricity. There is a certain amount of trepidation that comes from living along the active western volcanic zone. That being said, the people of West Iceland have seen opportunities. For every three Icelandic people, there is one Icelandic pony. Outside Reykjavik, Becca Rist follows a lifelong dream as she shares her country on horseback with visitors each day. In Hapnafjardish, Thora applies her passion for art and innovation to her herbal salt company, Herta Islandica. Here she infuses wild Icelandic blueberries and brown kelp from the west fjords into salt garnishes that enhance any dish. Forty miles north of Reykjavik, in the town of Borgafjöll, Guran draws upon family knowledge in her work as a wool colorist and botanist. So my name is Guðrún Bjarnadóttir. Uh, I grew up in Reykjavík, but now I live in uh, Borgarfjörður. I'm a, a botanist and I am also a veterinarian technician. And well, I've always loved animals. I have a dog, I have chicken, and uh, I always wanted to be a farmer. But that didn't work out and after that I sort of turned to botany and ended up using plants to color wool. I grew up in a great coloring tradition. My mother was a sewing teacher, my grandmother was knitting and she taught me how to recognize the plants. Iceland is only a small island. We only have 450 plant species so our problem is we have so few plants we can color with. Norway has 1300. We also came as settlers from the British Isles and they have 6000. So they can get all colors. We cannot get, for example, we cannot get good red and blue. We cannot get blue at all. Blue is the color of the kings and the rich people and that's because it was so rare to get. The wool that I use uh, to color, it's Icelandic wool from Icelandic sheep and it's made in the East Tex wool factory, the only wool factory we have in Iceland. I enjoy most uh, in this process uh, the surprise of the colors. You can never control the colors. If you could control them completely, it wouldn't be any fun anymore. Even after I've been coloring now for, well, almost 10 years, I'm still uh, finding new colors and getting the, the great wow moment. And I, I think this is in my genes. I had no chance of doing anything else. My, my family didn't have horses, but I know when I was four and we saw horses out in the field, I told my parents, you can leave me there and pick me up later. <laughs> and, and so I, I wanted to be around these animals. So I was uh, 12 years old when I got my first horse. Now we have more than 40 horses. They are all different individuals. Bonding with a horse is among the most beautiful things you can do in your life. And get to know their character, how they are, and they are really like they, they allow you to, to get to know them very well. 
Icelandic horses, when you look at them, you see that they are smaller than many breeds. Their skills are the most important. That is the, the most, most important difference from other breeds because they, they are five-gated. Makes them really, really interesting because most horses in the world are three-gated. And that can be really fast. That's called flying pace. And some Icelandic horses can do that and some can't. And really interesting to know that it was recently actually there was a team of Swedish and Icelandic scientists. They found the gene that makes the horse go the fifth gate. So if the horse carry this gene, they can do it. If they don't, they can. There are horseback riding trails all over Iceland. And it's the best way to see them because you almost dance with the nature when you horseback ride through a beautiful, beautiful Icelandic landscape. There is like ice and fire and everything between. <laughs> In the beginning, I had to do everything. I was producing and designing and doing everything. But today I'm the CEO and I take care of the innovation, the development. Black lava salt. It's very popular because people like to try. It's about experience. We think so much of the lava and lava herbs. It's because we have that all around. In the summertime, I can just go outside and point at most of the herbs just in this little lava rock outside here. We in Ørsta Icelandica like to believe what is most unique is that we use uh, Icelandic wild herb mostly. We have a lot of people from the countryside and from the local area here to collect the herbs. But uh, then we hand pack everything and we make everything here and we, we like to have all the packing environmental friendly. So we use glass or cellophane or paper what they create in nature. We use herbs no one else has used uh, before. We think of food as a color and we think, think how it looks and how it sounds, the name, and then we learn to appreciate the taste. And our customers, they are innovating too because they are telling us what to do with the product because we, don't know, we just try something and it tastes nice, but we don't know how to combine in the cuisines so of our customer. They innovate with us. And I think this uh, environment and what, what is growing here is part of what the company became. In many Nordic countries, there is a time of life when people seek out new life abroad, sometimes permanently. Icelanders, however, like Gurun and Becca, often find their way back home. Why? Perhaps it is the natural beauty, the tight weave of family combined with the looser appreciation and freedom for innovation. In a place where ice meets fire in an ever new, and everlasting dance. What might you discover in Iceland? According to Jules Verne, Iceland marks the entry point to the center of the earth. We've seen a really nice variety of things. We've seen waterfalls, beautiful mountains with snow capped. Uh, we've been on a whale watching trip, which was very interesting saw several types of whales. Experience the old world, firmly embedded within the new. In the capital city of Reykjavik, the urban heart of Iceland. Jules Verne writes, my over-excitement was beyond all description. What excitements await you? Good morning, OET travelers, wherever you are. Welcome to Reykjavik, Iceland. My name is Neil McMahon and I'm one of the TLs here in Iceland. Now, as you know from your travels internationally, one of the ways to get to know a country's culture and history 
is through their food. And that's exactly what we're going to do here this morning. Uh, we're going to go inside one of the food uh, courts here in Reykjavik, and I'm going to introduce you to a traditional Icelandic dish that's been around for hundreds of years. So let's go inside. Here we have it, Svid, or sheep's head. So this is a dish that goes back hundreds of years, right back to the time of the settlement in the 9th century. Now to prepare this dish, what you actually have to do is you have to, uh, first of all, remove the hair of wool from the head, and that is done with a blowtorch. Then you cleave the head in two, and you boil it in water for around two hours. Now every part of the head is eaten. So we eat the ears, the eyes, the tongue, and of course uh, the meat that you will find on the bone as well. And what we have with it, mashed potatoes and turnip. Best thing is to actually just pull it apart like this. And then we can start to remove the meat. This is actually quite delicious. And here, one of the delicacies is actually the tongue. And of course, the eye is also regarded as being a delicacy. It's very, very good. A cool locally brewed beer to go with this traditional Icelandic dish. Now the interesting thing is that Iceland had one of the longest periods of prohibition of any country in Europe. Uh, this was introduced in 1915. However, the Spanish were quite unhappy with the fact that Icelanders had stopped buying uh, their wine, and so they threatened to stop buying Icelandic cod. So wine was allowed in 1922. Then, in the 1930s, uh, strong alcohol is allowed, but not beer. And this ban on beer remains until March 1989. After that, uh, beer is allowed, and we have been brewing some excellent craft beers since then. So those of you who do like beer, I think you're going to be uh, quite surprised to see what excellent beers are now on offer in Iceland. So, here you go. Stop. Welcome. Thank you. Very much. This is for you. It's a token. I'm from Florida, so you'll see. On most of the tours that I've taken, there's there's often a home hosted meal, and uh, it gets you in touch with the local folks. They give you their meal, uh, which is typical Icelandic. It'll probably be lamb or fish, and uh, we also get to meet the family. How are you? Oh, it was a great family. We had um, a mother who, with a little daughter who's about nine years old, and the mother's cousin was in town visiting. So the two ladies were just very, very friendly, very knowledgeable. The lady had just gone all out with uh, lamb stew and lamb. Nice to have you all. We also were lucky, we met a hamster. One of the children here had a hamster. There is no private care. No, not really. Everybody is covered and everybody is equal. We just sat around and talked a lot of uh, education issues and some politics and some health care issues and really just had a wonderful evening with them. The dinner was delightful and then the dessert was not to be believed. It was a date pudding cake with a little caramel sauce on it and whipped cream. Now how can you go wrong with this? <laughs> so Iceland's impressive geysers, waterfalls, springs, and volcanoes are all part of what makes this land 
so inspiring to writers and all who visit. We are a very small nation inhabiting this island of Iceland, only approximately 365,000, which makes us one of the smallest nations on earth, actually. And we're a strange mix of, of Norse, Viking, blood, and uh, we're also descendants of the people of Ireland and Scotland. Now that reflects in our love of nature and also a love of storytelling. So when you're in Iceland, you will hear a lot about elves and trolls. And on that note, uh, the statue behind me is actually called the Troll. And it is located in a very beautiful uh, sculpture park that is located uh, in front of the hotel that uh, uh, you will be staying at. In Iceland, we are all about sustainability and almost 100% of our energy is green, renewable, uh, originating in uh, geothermal resources and uh, also uh, hydroelectric. Now behind me is a borehole and we draw our hot water straight from the earth and uh, pump it into uh, people's houses. Now, you can also see the hotel we're staying at, which is the uh, Hilton Nordica Hotel. One of the many benefits of living in Iceland is our plentiful access to clean air and also clean water. And you can see a lot of uh, fountains like the one behind me uh, all over uh, Reykjavik. Icelanders are extremely friendly, easygoing and accommodating. And one great way to meet the locals is in one of our swimming pools. Now this happens to be the largest one in Iceland and is located very close to the hotel we are staying at. Now, for obvious reasons, the swimming pools have been closed for the last few weeks, but they're actually due to open in the middle of May. One of the reasons for visiting Iceland is definitely tasting some of the local food. Uh, we take great pride in our lamb and our fish, but it's also nice to be able to treat yourselves uh, to something like this, the uh, world famous Icelandic hot dog, as we call it. Now, I'm truly looking forward to meeting you in Iceland, uh, showing you around, and until then I hope you stay healthy and uh, safe. The Westman Islands are located 4.6 miles off the southern coast of Iceland. Known to locals as the Westman Air, this rugged archipelago is a geological work in progress. The Westman Islands are one of the youngest uh, land in uh, Iceland. Uh, the oldest of the Westman Islands is only 40,000 years old, and the youngest is only 42 years old. So it's still in making. Stick around and you may see something new come up. In 1973, an unexpected volcanic eruption struck the island of Hamai, forcing its residents to evacuate. Lava flows and volcanic ash destroyed hundreds of homes and threatened to ruin the island's economically critical harbor. With three days in this remote destination, what could you learn about its dramatic history? What stories of struggle and survival might you hear from the resilient people who call these islands home? This island was, I think, the best playground for kids and the best place to grow up in. You learn to respect other people. You learn to respect the nature because of the force of the nature, both the wind, uh, eruptions, the ocean, everything. The night when the eruption took place, 23rd of January 1973, I remember it clearly because I was woken up by my mother, uh, two o'clock in the night, 
and I, I was a little bit confused and I slapped her face because I, I wanted to sleep longer. But I was really happy when I woke up and I went into the kitchen and I saw a wall of fire and I thought, no, this is fabulous. Why did you wake me up earlier? Because I thought it was a New Year's Eve again. I didn't realize the seriousness of, of this situation. Only one man died in the eruption. But I know of people that, that uh, committed suicide. Families were torn apart. A lot of things that we haven't told stories about. This is some stories that we like to keep apart, but this is a fact. My name is Arnor Hermansson, and I'm a baker, and I'm an artist, and I'm, I'm a musician, and I have lived all my life here in Westmanalands. I run a company, a bakery I started for about 20 years ago. My ambition is to do the business well, and I hopefully can jump out of the business and turn to artist and music completely. My name is Helga Johansdottir. I'm the manager of the company and I was born here and I've always lived here. There's a lot of challenge to live here, you know, you nearly face it every day. But the opportunity is to accept this challenge and that makes you stronger and you always find a way to live your life here. There is a special culture here. The culture is really about people who know that they have to stick together and life is not easy. So many terrible things in the history that never broke down the human spirit here because we are fighters. Westman Islands is not only home to about 4,300 people, but it's also home to one of the biggest stocks or colonies of puffins in the world. And they can be seen readily just as long as you go to the right spots. She is, uh, she is slightly uh, disadvantaged because she isn't waterproof. But then again, she survived and she will have a beautiful life in here eating tour guides. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you have this? There is another one here called Tolti. The Tolti is um, misbehaving to a degree because he's just reaching puberty and tends to fall in love with shoe wear. So. An extraordinary destination, with a history as dramatic as its volcanic landscape. The people of the Westman Islands are fiercely proud of the Westman Islands, as they should be. So much so that the Westman Islands are said to be 15, but the people of the Westman Islands say they are 16, with the 16th island being Iceland in the north. Extend your Iceland adventure and journey to the Westman Islands, an experience you won't forget.